that's it. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar on ultrasound-based complete evaluation of the infertile patient in a single visit, presented by Dr. Yvette Grossman. At the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be familiar with ASRM recommendations and they should be able to recognize sonographic findings associated with pelvic adhesions, as well as understand why 3D ultrasound should become the standard imaging modality to evaluate uterine shape. And finally, participants should be able to describe the steps in a complete single-visit sonographic evaluation of the infertile woman. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Grossman has no disclosures. Planners and staff also have no disclosures. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Yvette Grossman. Um, Hello everyone and welcome. So as Kathy said, my talk this evening is entitled Single Visit Ultrasound Based Infertility Evaluation and I hope that I'm able to full oh, information. Okay, we already said uh, no disclosures and so this statement is from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and they published this in 2015 and this is from their practice committee which states that diagnostic evaluation for infertility in women should be conducted in a systematic, expeditious and cost-effective manner using the least invasive methods. This is what is actually happening in most of the United States currently. So this is what it looks like when a woman with infertility or subfertility presents for evaluation. Often they will start with a two-dimensional ultrasound to look at follicles. Then they may be scheduled for a hysterosalpingogram to evaluate the tubes and the endometrial cavity. If there's a finding, then they may undergo a hysteroscopy or perhaps a sonohistogram. Sometimes the hysteroscopy is done first, then they have the HSG, and so on. So there's nothing systematic, cost-effective, or um, expeditious about this current method of evaluating our women with infertility. So this is what we have proposed, and we published a paper in Fertility and Sterility this year. We entitled this the Modern Infertility Evaluation, and this is what I'm going to be presenting to you. So the, the term one-stop shopping for the infertility evaluation was first used by Kelly and Campbell uh, before even the advent of 
of three-dimensional ultrasound. And now we have elaborated on it to include some newer techniques. So the first step that we do is we start out with our conventional ultrasound. So conventional two-dimensional ultrasound. We look at the uterus. You look at the myometrium, endometrium. Then we focus on the ovaries. We assess the ovaries, look for cysts. Then we focus on the adnexa. Then we move on to the cul-de-sac. And then part of our procedure is that we perform what we call a dynamic exam. So we look for the mobility of the pelvic organs and we look for adhesions. And I'm going to be showing you examples of how all of this is performed. So the first thing that we do is look at our uterine orientation. So here you can see an anverted uterus. Here we have an anti-flexed uterus. Over here we have retroverted. And then here I want you to notice I want you to notice, sorry, this one here, because I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this, but this is anaverted and retroflex. Oh, they yeah. do not commonly do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so something is going on here to cause this uterus to have disorientation. Next, we look at the myometrium. So here I'm sweeping from side to side along the sagittal plane, and you notice mm -hmm. that there are two oh, yeah. There's an anterior intramural fibroid and a posterior submucosal fibroid. In this case, we can see a posterior submucosal fibroid. These are three patients that had sonographic findings consistent with adenomyosis. So I included these examples to show you what adenomyosis looks like on ultrasound. Typically, you'll have a posterior myometrial wall that is much thicker than the anterior wall. You may have subendometrial glands, such as are seen here. And you may lose the endometrial myometrial junction. So here, we can't tell where the endometrium ends and the myometrium begins. Now I'm going to be focusing on the endometrium. This here is a normal appearing follicular face endometrium. You measure it at its widest point. Over here we have a little nebothian cyst which is not clinically significant and we don't typically report these since they are not a clinically significant finding. This patient has a hyperechoic structure here in the endometrium. You can see the measurements. This is a polyp. This is a typical appearance of a polyp. Here we're looking at a transverse cut of the uterus, same patient. So we can see that the polyp is over here. We may see other findings when we look at the endometrium. So what you see here is in the posterior wall, you can see the endometrium sharply. But if you look at Missing a little chunk here. Here we're missing So over here what you see is that you're missing a chunk of the endometrium. You see the endometrium here and here. But what's going on here is we have a synechia. Same here. These are uh, findings consistent with the synechia. Then I move on and look at the ovaries. Here we have a uh, normal appearing left ovary. This is just uh, 90 degree views of the ovary, sagittal and transverse. We can see some nice follicles. This is the patient's right ovary and we notice this hyperechoic structure this is a typical appearance for a dermoid. So I'm only showing you a few examples of findings that we may have because it would be a whole other lecture for me to show you all the possible findings in the myometrium, endometrium, and adnexa. Mm -hmm. 
here's another patient. So what we notice here is there's the cyst. It has homogeneous echoes, typical appearing endometrioma. This picture is basically, you could put it in a textbook. This is an endometrioma. The other thing I'm noticing, though, is that the ovaries are touching each other. They're adhered to each other. We also call this kissing ovaries. So when I see this, I know that this patient has adhesions because the ovaries should never be in this uh, location as far as um, being so close to each other. You may find dilated tubular fluid collection in the adnexa. This is consistent with a hydrosalpinx. You can see the incomplete septa. Same here. Here's another example. What we're seeing here, these little mural irregularities, those are not papillations. These are actually the endosalpingeal folds, and this appearance here has been called the cogwheel sign. Okay, so here's a live clip from, well, not live, but this is an actual clip from a patient. So here is a leftover you're going to see. And down here, you're going to see this tubular collection. And that's how a hydrocelpinx would look if you were actually scanning it live and moving your probe from side to side. So ultrasound is a very dynamic exam. It's very difficult to... Uh, be able to perform uh, an optimal ultrasound exam if you're reading still images because you're limited to the images that are being sent to you. Okay, so here's the uterus over here. And this patient was sent in to us for a pelvic mass, for a left adnexal mass. Still image, sure, I see a mass over here. I know this is her uterus. I see this. I'm thinking this is a septation. But what happens when I start poking around? Well, what I notice here is this moves when you apply repeated pressure, okay? This is a peritoneal inclusion cyst. And what we're seeing here are the fimbria waving to us. So as opposed to being a nonspecific adnexal mass and referring the patient to gynonc by poking very gently, you just repeatedly probe that area, we see that these are filmy adhesions and they allow the fluid to move within it and we can see that this is the fimbria. Here's two other examples of perineal inclusion cysts. So over here it's hard to diagnose them, though, on still images. You really need to be able to move that area where the adhesions are to assess how thick or thin they are. And that's really the only way to be sure of what you're looking at. And here's another example. This ovary is trapped in these adhesions. Okay, so Moving on and talking about adhesions, I already showed you the finding of the kissing ovaries. Whenever you see that, that patient has adhesions. Another uh, way that we look for adhesions is it's called the sliding sign. And what we do is we push. So we're pushing in the posterior cul-de-sac, and we want to make sure that things slide. See how over here, bowel is sliding. This is your cervix. So nothing's adhered, okay? So I don't see any adhesions in the posterior cul-de-sac. What about this patient? Right here, we have a loop of bowel. And you see as I push, instead of moving, the bowel is just stretching. Up here, we have some sliding. But here, this is tethered. Now, this is a significant finding because if this patient need surgery, you want to make sure that the person who's going to be performing surgery feels confident that they can deal with pelvic adhesions. Or they may request that a more senior resident or a more senior partner come in and assist them with the case. Here we're going to look at a left ovary and again 
we do this routinely with all of our fertility patients and pelvic pain patients. Okay, here's the ovary. It's sliding nicely. Nothing stuck to it. Well, what about this ovary? First of all, I noticed there's an endometrioma and it's also completely plastered to the back of this uterus. It's not stuck to the posterior pelvis, but it is completely stuck here. See how they move as one, the uterus and the ovary? The other thing is, remember I told you about the anaverted retroflexed uterus? Anaverted retroflexed, and the reason is because it's being tethered over here. So I strongly encourage you to get this paper. Uh, the lead author was uh, Stefano Guerriero, very well known in the uh, deep infiltration, basically in the endometriosis world. What I'm showing you here is deep infiltrating endometriosis. So right here, okay, that is endometriosis on the bowel. This is a loop of bowel, and that's the ovary. So we didn't used to think that we could see these things on ultrasound. We used to always think you either needed to do a laparoscopy or at least an MRI to be able to diagnose or see deep infiltrating endometriosis. But the problem was we weren't looking and we weren't trained to look. You can find these lesions if you know how to look for them. And if you get this paper, it goes through step by step what these things look like and how to look for them. Again, this is very significant because if this patient, for example, also has an endometrioma and goes to surgery and the provider who's going to be doing the surgery isn't aware that the patient also has deep infiltrating endometriosis, bowel is plastered, perhaps the posterior cul-de-sac is obliterated, when they go in, they may not be prepared for what they find and there's nothing worse than taking a patient to the OR and then having to get out because you're in over your head. So to summarize this uterine orientation, you need to look for adhesions. You will see this orientation often when someone has had a C-section. The anterior lower uterine segment might be scarred up here, and so that can be a cause. The other cause typically is endometriosis. And then when you see kissing ovaries, you need to look for adhesions elsewhere because you're seeing ovaries that are, that are adhered to each other. So the next step. Now, I wrote this as a next step, but in reality, the 3D ultrasound, I perform at the same time that I'm doing uh, my conventional ultrasound. So when I look at the uterus, I also do a 3D sweep, and I reconstruct the cavity. So here are three different patients who, on conventional ultrasound, appear to have the same anatomy. Now, invariably, we will have these patients referred to us for 3D ultrasound, usually with a diagnosis of a bicornuate uterus, although a bicornuate uterus is extremely rare. If I see this on a conventional scan and someone was to show me a still image, my first thought would be a septate uterus, not a bicornuate uterus. But let's see what's going on with these three patients. Well, look how similar the 2D images looked, and look how different their anatomy really is. So you cannot diagnose a malarian duct anomaly on a conventional ultrasound. What you can see over here, this is just an arcuate uterus. This is a normal variant. Here we have a partial septum in the second image. And here we have a complete septate uterus. This is not bicornuate because the myometrium does not dip down, okay, and follow the septum. The myometrium is either flat or convex up top. That's consistent with a septum. This case looks pretty unremarkable. Turns out this patient has a unicornuate uterus. Now, these are two other uh, types of unicornuate uteri that exist. 
This one is called a unicorn with uterus with a communicating rudimentary horn. This one has a non-communicating rudimentary horn. It's very, very important to diagnose these correctly, especially the non-communicating ones, because an ectopic pregnancy can actually develop in the non-communicating horn, and that is life-threatening to the woman. Now, if this patient underwent an HSG, they would see the the unicornuit uh, cavity, but they would miss the non-communicating horn. So let's talk a little further about HSG. So here we have uh, an HSG, and we can see that the tubes are open bilaterally. We can see that there's a partial septum. Again, this, these patients typically are diagnosed as having bicornuit rather than septate uteri. But if you ever need to guess, guess septum, because you're going to be right 10 times over a bicornuit uterus. So what kind of uterus does this patient have? It might be a bicornuit uterus, but it might be a septate uterus. So this patient essentially underwent a study that only gave you half the information. It's incomplete, and now the patient has to undergo another test. So in this study published in 2012, uh, BOCA looked at 101 patients that had uh, different types of either acquired or congenital uterine abnormalities. So on the left, you can see what the different uh, categories were. And what they found was that sonohistogram using 3D so a 3D sonohistogram correctly diagnosed all of the congenital uterine anomalies and almost all of the acquired abnormalities such as polyps or fibroids, while HSG missed more than a third of the acquired and congenital abnormalities. So again, this just shows how HSG is a very limited exam compared to 3D ultrasound and 3D sonohistography. So next step in our exam, once we've performed the basic ultrasound with the 3D ultrasound and we've basically poked around, you know, not really poking, but gently palpating the structures to look for adhesions, we introduce fluid. So we move on and perform the sonohistogram portion and the tubal assessment portion, which is called hysterosalpingo contrast sonography. That is quite a mouthful, and from now on, I'm just going to call it HICOSI for short. So now we're going to be assessing the endometrial cavity in more detail. And the AIUM came up with these uh, practice guidelines in 2012 of uh, how to perform or when to perform a sonohistogram. If you want the whole practice guideline, you can actually, I gave you the reference right here, and you can look it up. But a couple important points to note. Sonohistoriography should not be performed in a woman who is pregnant or who could be pregnant. That seems pretty obvious, but patients with infertility are often feeling very anxious. They want tests done yesterday. They don't think they can get pregnant, so they're willing to have the test at any time during the cycle. You need to be sure that the patient could not possibly be pregnant before you perform this test. You also want to perform this test during the follicular phase, ideally the earlier side of the follicular phase, once the patient has uh, stopped bleeding heavily. And that's because if you perform it too late in the cycle, the endometrial lining starts to get thick and it's really hard to see anything. Okay, so this is an example of a um, conventional ultrasound. This is a transverse view of the uterus. I noticed this hypoechoic structure here, and here's the endometrium. So here I'm thinking it looks like this fibroid might be a partially submucosal. I do my 3D sweep and I reconstruct it, and on my 3D ultrasound, looks like it's partially submucosal, this portion right here. Then we moved on and did our sonohistogram. 
and it turned out that the fibroid actually was a budding. So it didn't have a significant submucosal component that you could remove with a hysteroscope. This is why it's important to evaluate the endometrial cavity and fertility patients in more detail, not just with a 3D ultrasound. In this study that was published in 2011, the uh, hysteroscopy was compared to sonohysterography using saline and were, was found basically the two modalities were found to be equivalent as far as detecting submucosal fibroids. The difference is that a saline infusion sonohistogram typically allows for much more information because you should also be performing the full scan and looking at the ovaries, the uterus, and looking for adhesions, while the hysteroscopy is only going to show you the inside of the uterus. What other findings might we see in a sonohistogram? Well, here's an example, actually. Let me go back one slide. So if someone were to send me a still image of this, I'd say, this looks pretty unremarkable. The endometrium is a little hard to see, but I don't really see anything in it. But when you put fluid in, you see this hyperechoic lesion over here with a little feeder vessel. This is characteristic appearance of a polyp. The 3D ultrasound just shows exactly where the polyp is. And this polyp may actually be obstructing the right uh, cornu, so that um, this would be another significant finding in a patient with infertility, besides the fact that she has a polyp, which also can impair fertility. Another case, again, this endometrium on the still image looks pretty unremarkable. We put fluid in it, turns out there's an 11 millimeter sessile polyp. Again, these are associated with impairing fertility, so this is a significant finding. This is what it looks like on three-dimensional ultrasound. So same study also looked at detection of endometrial polyps comparing sonohistography with hysteroscopy. Sensitivity was the same, 100% for both. Specificity was slightly lower with the sonohistography, but not enough to be clinically significant. And again, we have the benefits with the sonohistogram that we're also performing an ultrasound, and we can assess the rest of the pelvic structures. Cesarean scar defects are something that we are seeing more and more in our practice, and I would imagine that you are too. So over here, the first picture on the left, you can see in this transabdominal image already this fluid collection right here okay, in the anterior lower uterine segment. This is the same patient. We did a sonohistogram, and you can see the defect right here. So these are also called now C-section scar isthmoseals, um, or C-section scar niche. These are associated with multiple things, including secondary infertility. The theory is that the blood somehow, uh, when it starts to dissolve, travels up into the cavity and may impair implantation or may be toxic to sperm. It's associated with an increased risk for cesarean scar pregnancy, morbidly adherent or invasive placentation, uterine rupture, abnormal uterine bleeding, and that's what we're seeing uh, this in most of our cases where patients are coming in with this abnormal uterine bleeding. And there's also an increased complication rate in GYN procedures. So we've seen cases where the IUDs are embedded in that C-section -sec scar isthmusial or have actually gone through it. So this first example I'm showing here, the C-section scar looks good. You have nice thickness of the myometrium here. I'm not seeing any fluid pooling. We did a sonohistogram, and again, there was not a significant C-section scar uh, defect or ismocel. You can see nice thick myometrium, as opposed to this case. Again, transabdominally, in this case, you're seeing this fluid collection. And then in the sonohistogram, you can see this defect in the anterior lower uterine segment. 
the anterior lower uterine segment myometrium here is quite thin. And I have seen cases where there's basically nothing or a millimeter of myometrium left, and then you have uh, the serosa and the bladder mucosa. Here's an example. Patient came in with uh, secondary fertility and also abnormal uterine bleeding. And I want you to focus in the circle. So we see something going on there. We're going to do a sonohistogram. And that area had been filled with clot. Here you can see a little piece of that clot still remaining. Again, remember, ultrasound is a very dynamic exam. You need to use your probe just like you would if you were doing a manual exam. So we ended up flushing all of the clot out of that C-section scar defect. And this is what it looked like. So over here, you can see there's really not much myometrium left. And this is what it looked like on 3D. So here's the endometrial cavity at the top. The uterus is curved, so there isn't a mass here. This is just myometrium. And then the whole scar was open this wide. Now, this is a different case where a patient who had had two DNE procedures for retained products came in with uh, impaired fertility, did a sonohistogram. And what we see is, first of all, the catheter doesn't go all the way up to the top of the cavity. And you're seeing these synechia. See these bands? So unfortunately, this patient ended up with an Asherman syndrome. This is what it looked like on 3D ultrasound. This was a very interesting case. So this patient had had a baby by cesarean section. And her first baby was uh, an IVF pregnancy. She had the C-section. Everything was normal. And then the patient decided to have another child. She had frozen embryos. So she went to her fertility uh, specialist. They did a so they did a hysterosalpingogram because that's routine, for, even though she had embryos. And the hysterosalpingogram diagnosed her with a unicornoid uterus. This was very confusing, as you can imagine, to everyone because she did not start out with a unicornoid uterus with her first baby. So everyone was wondering where half of her uterus went. So she came to see us for a sonohistogram, and this is what we found. So she does not have a unicornoid uterus. She has a functional unicornoid uterus because this whole area is now completely obliterated with adhesions. And they were able to go in and resect that and fix it. But again, this shows how hysterosalpingogram is just not a, an adequate study anymore in this day and age to be evaluating the endometrial cavity. OK, let's talk about hysterosalpingo contrast sonography, or HIDCOSI. So once I'm done looking at my endometrial cavity, I blow up. So I use a balloon catheter. And during the sonohistrography portion, I don't blow up the balloon because I don't want to include any of my cavity but I do for this test, and I'm going to show you when. So what are the current tubal patency tests that are out there? The gold standard is laparoscopy and chromoperturbation, where you essentially put some dye in with a hysteroscope, and then you watch it through a laparoscope come out through the tubes. Now, obviously, most people are not doing this, but this is the gold standard. What most people are still doing in this country is hysterosalpingogram. And this test, as we know, involves fluoroscopy, which is radiation, and dye. So there's a potential for dye allergy. And what we now are proposing, and what is being done in a large part of Europe now, is hycosi. Hycosi in Europe is done most often with contrast because contrast has been approved in that country. In this country, we don't have contrast that has been approved for use in the uterus. So we are doing it with saline and air, and I'm going to show you how. 
Before we move on to that, I just want to show you this one study by Luciano and colleagues. So remember that laparoscopy and chromoperturbation are the gold standard. And they compared HSG to laparoscopy and chromoperturbation and HICOSI to the gold standard. And they found that the sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values were essentially equal. So how do we do this HICOSI? Like I said, it's always the second part after the sonohistogram portion. So what I do is I blow up my balloon as soon as I'm done with the sonohistogram portion. Then I disconnect the syringe that I was using with the saline. And I, if I still have uh, quite a bit of saline in my syringe, I dump out half of it. And then I just pull back room air. And that's my contrast, my free contrast. Then you're going to turn your transvaginal probe and you're going to orient along the uterus in a transverse plane so you can see where you think that the tubes basically open. So you want to look for the cornua bilaterally. And I'm going to show you examples of this. And then we're going to tilt the syringe back and forth and create an air saline column. We're not going to shake it. That, I've tried that technique. That never worked for me. What I mean by creating an air sailing column is this. Okay, so what I'm doing here is, as I'm looking at the screen, at the ultrasound screen, I am very slowly, a milliliter at a time, injecting air, now water. Air, water. Air, water. Okay? And so basically you're making your own contrast. We're going to be focusing our ultrasound probe here. Okay, first typically we focus on one side. So we look here, and then when, after we've seen the air come out through this side, hopefully, we focus here. And this is just a picture from the operating room that shows you here we have the fallopian tube draped over the ovary, and you can see the fimbria essentially caressing the ovaries, as an attending of mine used to say. OK, so this is what I mean by orienting your probe so that you have the cornu and that ovary in the same plane. Here's my uterus over in the screen, in the upper right hand of the screen. OK, this is kind of a transverse or oblique view. My endometrial cavity is filled with water, well, saline. Here's my uterovarian ligament, and here's my ovary. I know that the air bubbles, if this tube is open, are going to have to come out somewhere between here and here. So this is where I'm going to focus. We can't see fallopian tubes when they're healthy, so we just need to know where they should be and focus our eyes there. OK? All right. So. Here we go. Here, what we're doing is, there we go, all right. We're looking here. We think that the air bubbles, or I'm sorry, the cornu, I'm following the endometrium. So I'm thinking that the tube is going to come out through here. I can't see the tube, but I'm figuring out where the best place to look. I can see my uterovarian ligament and my ovary. So I'm going to focus here as I inject the air and saline. And here we go. All right. You see the bright white is the air. The water pushes it out. And you can see it's coming out through here. All right, let me show you another example. Over here, we have our uterus on the left side. See the air bubbles? Now they're coming out through here. And you're going to follow them out and all the way out here. So that's what it looks like. That's what using air looks like as a contrast media.
sometimes we get lucky and a patient has uh, anatomy that allows us to look at both sides at once. So here we're transverse on the uterus. And you can actually see the air bubbles coming out on both sides. We always try to do this view first because if you can see them coming out of both sides right away, it saves the patient further air and fluid, um, which does cause cramping and uh, the procedure is finished much quicker. But I'd say that this happens probably um, one out of, well, 25% of the time that we can see them coming out both sides. Now you don't need to see the air coming out all the way from the uterus and all the way out to the ovary. Most of the time we only see a portion of where the air is coming out because you have bowel obscuring portions of your tube. You may have bowel gas obscuring part of your ovary. So you only need to see the air bubbles somewhere along the course between the uterus and the ovary to know that that tube is open. Okay, in this example we can see bowel here. It's obscuring part of our tube clearly because we see the air coming out from the uterus and then we see it coming out over here next to the ovary. It's okay, you don't need to see it all the way. The tube's either open or it's not open. The air is not going to shoot through part of the tube if the tube is partially obstructed. Okay, endometrial cavity with fluid over here. We're going to be looking out in this direction. And there it goes, okay? Sometimes you might see the air coming straight out of the uterus. We couldn't see it down here because of the way that the uterus angled. So we focused and looked here. But if you start out with your probe focusing on part of the endometrial cavity and where you think the cornu is, the uterovarian ligament on that side and the ovary on that side, then you have your maximum field of view and you're almost inevitably going to see the air coming out if it does come out through that side. Okay, so sometimes you cannot get the ovary in the same plane or same screen as your uterus. This patient's ovary was way off and there was just no way that we were going to get her ovary in the same field of view with the cornu, okay? So then in those cases, usually what I do is I start out by looking in this area and as much as I can see, I don't focus on the ovary. That tube is open. Okay, clearly the air is coming out. And even if we only saw the air shoot out here and not up here, that tube is open because the air is not going to shoot out from here quickly if the tube is blocked over here. It's like trying to push, if you're trying to push air and water through a hose, but you had the hose closed off. You just can't. Here's an example where we couldn't see the air coming out through the cornu. We couldn't see it along the uterovarian ligament area, so we focused here around the ovary, and here you're going to see the air coming out. There it goes. So it's coming out. It must be the fimbria because it's right where the ovary is. So in our protocol, we always start out by trying to see both tubes at once if we can line, get that view lined up. If not, we focus first on one side. Typically, I look at the side that I think is going to be the easiest to see, and then we focus on the other side. If I don't see air bubbles coming out from the cornu or somewhere around the broad ligament, then we focus lastly around the ovary. And somewhere there you should see it. All right, what's going on in this patient? We can see saline 
is coming in, the cavity is getting bigger, and we see this fluid swirling back away from the cornua. This is a patient who had bilaterally blocked tubes. So if both tubes are blocked, you're going to know it first because it gets really hard to push the fluid. Unfortunately, the patient starts to feel pain. And because the cavity will expand, and you'll see the air kind of swirling around. So those three things are, it, you just know in that, that that test, those tubes are blocked. If one tube is blocked, you'll see air bubbles coming out through the other tube, but there's no test that actually tells us if we don't see air that a single tube is blocked. So in the case where patients have one tube open and one tube blocked, all we can say is, and all I say is, patency through, for example, the right tube was uh, confirmed by air bubbles exiting through the right corno. The left corno, uh, no air bubbles were seen exiting the left side of the uterus. This may be due to tubal spasm um, or tubal blockage. As long as you don't see a hydrocelpinx, the management would not be any different whether the patient has one blocked tube or no blocked tubes. It's only if they have a hydrocelpinx or both tubes are blocked where management differs. All right, what about this case? Is this too patent? All right, I'm focusing, I think my air bubble should come out through here. And I have a pretty good view between here and the ovary. And I'm not seeing any air bubbles coming out. So in this case, the conclusion is I could not prove patency in the left tube. Doesn't mean the tube is blocked. They could be having a tubal spasm. I do put in my report that I did not see a hydrocelpinx at the end of the procedure. That's clinically relevant because if there was a hydrocelpinx and they were going to undergo IVF, then they would need surgery. So if you don't see the air bubbles coming out, you just say patency could not be confirmed through that tube. So comparing HSG to hycosi. Well, we know that with HSG we need fluoroscopy. There can be dye allergies. You don't have any of that with hycosi. HSG really is just a screening test for malaria and anomalies. It's not really an adequate test as we've seen to evaluate the uterine cavity. While hycosi is a diagnostic test for, uh, I'm sorry, while hycosi, which would include sonohysterography with 3D, is a diagnostic test. When we do a hycosi, we can assess, and we do assess the rest of the pelvis, as I showed you, steps one and steps two. It's a procedure that's done in the office can be done by the fertility doctor, who often typically is the provider of the patient. And it's at significantly lower cost. And the patient can have a complete evaluation in just one visit, as opposed to having an ultrasound one day and then another day having an HSG and then possibly the next month having an MRI. So I'm going to go through this quickly. Tips to minimize patient discomfort, since these are pretty much, I believe, a no-brainer. Do not use a tenaculum. I never use a tenaculum. You don't need to use a tenaculum to get these catheters in. They're not IUDs. Use a small speculum. I use the Peterson speculum. You can always use a larger one if you don't have adequate view. Put the fluid in slowly. Blow up the balloon at the widest part of the cavity. So if the patient's comfortable, the more comfortable the patient is, the easier the exam will be for you as well. So to conclude, when we started, we discussed the ASRM practice committee guidelines or opinion, which basically said evaluation of women with infertility should be systematic, cost-effective, expeditious, and least invasive. And hopefully I've proven to you that single visit, ultrasound-based pelvic assessment, and tubal evaluation is the way to achieve this. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Grossman. And I think we have a couple of questions. Are you able to see them on your screen? All right. Uh, I just think, oops, I just clicked one and I got rid of it. Sorry, people. Let me, uh, so it was the first question. Uh, do you evaluate for vaginal septa on ultrasound? Unfortunately, right now, ultrasound is not uh, the best modality uh, to evaluate for vaginal septums. That's the only time when I would say for now, MRI is uh, better. However, there are people in Europe who are putting fluid in the vagina and doing ultrasound so, um, of the vagina. So I think uh, we will figure out how to do it in the near future, hopefully. Uh, let's see. How long does it take to... So next question. How long does it take to do this fertility workup ultrasound? I started doing this in 2011. Um, and I would say at the time, we all had to learn how to do it. The sonographers had to learn how to focus on the correct area. It probably used to take us 20 minutes, and now it can take us uh, 8 to 12 minutes. Uh, the only part that really takes, the part that takes the longest, I would say, is if someone has a, a cervix that's stenotic, that's what takes longer because getting the catheter in is typically the longest part of the procedure. Uh, insurance, uh, okay, well, I don't have any good news on that one. No, uh, insurance does not reimburse for hycosis. They reimburse for the sonohistogram. So I wish I could tell you that things had changed. The problem is that not that many people are doing it, so people need to start doing it, and then we'll be able to convince the insurance companies. Oh, the diagnostic criteria. What are the diagnostic criteria for a T-shaped uterus? We don't really have a good definition as of yet, and we also don't have a good definition yet what uh, constitutes a C-section scar is missile. So. For now, it's just a subjective uh, appearance of the uterus. If you notice that the waist, what I like to call the waist of the uterus, the part uh, where the majority of the endometrial cavity is, that should be uh, triangular. If it's really, really narrow and then the tubes come out kind of looking like a T and there's a sharp curve, I call it a T. The problem with T-shaped uterus, though, is that there is no, uh, there's no treatment. So I'm very careful not to diagnose a T-shaped uterus unless I'm really sure, because once you diagnose it, there's nothing you can offer the patient. So I tend to err on the side of undercalling them. So this question is, do you give pain medication before the procedure? Uh, I work with uh, referring providers, so the patients are referred to me. We do have a form that needs to get filled out when they get referred, and on that form it does recommend that the patients take 800 milligrams of ibuprofen one to two hours before the procedure. But I have to be honest, a lot of patients don't do it. A lot of providers don't tell them to do it. I used to perform hysterosalpingograms. I'm an ob and this procedure is a tenth uh, of what that procedure was as far as discomfort. I think, one, because you don't need to use a tenaculum. We don't use an acorn, which is what you use with HSGs. The catheters have gotten better, and um, it, most patients don't take anything. And the next question is about the ESHRA classification of uterine anomalies. And I know that this is now uh, starting to be seen more often in the literature. Um, I, I'm not currently using it yet, but don't be surprised if next year I'm giving a webinar on that. <laughs> Best catheter. Um, I've tried several. Uh, I like, um, I don't think I can give actual, yeah, I can't give actual names. So there's really not that many balloon catheters out there. 
I would try, there's two main companies, and I would just try both and see which one you like better. For me, one was much better than the other. Okay, now this question is more for someone who's dealing with fertility patients. Uh, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, so the amount of saline in the syringe. Uh, right now, we use a 60cc syringe just because that's what we have. You honestly could probably do this with a 20cc syringe. I, the better you get, the less you use. So I use most of my fluid during the sonohistogram because I don't blow up the balloon. So that's when I'm using most of the fluid. Once I blow up the balloon, I probably only use 5 to 10 cc's of saline at most. If you can't tell if the air is coming out, then you just stop the procedure and say it's non-diagnostic. And the better you get, the less of those you have. I mean, if you can't tell with this, they can always have an HSG. It's just I don't think that the HSG should be the first test anymore. It should be uh, you know, a test if the hycosis is non-diagnostic, which is really rare. Okay, I think, oh, and uh, this question, role of 3D ultrasound inversion mode for antral follicle count. I have uh, seen cases of that. We're not a fertility practice. We're an ultrasound practice, so I don't actually have experience with that, and I do know some fertility people that are using it, but I can't answer that question since I don't use it. Okay, I think that is all of the questions, and I thank you all for attending, and hopefully you learned something. Thank you so much, Dr. Grossman, and our thanks to all of you who participated tonight. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation, and will join us again for future webinars. Good night, everyone. I prefer speaking live.